now on record before i begin i want to find out if i'm audible enough can you guys hear me yes sir okay good so let's um share my screen and we so this is this is our page on sakai group nine and i'll go straight away to our schedule of work which we completed with our last class so here we have um, six weeks of classes and rather 12 classes. At the beginning of the semester, we had introduced with, um, with speech acts. We had distinguished different types of um, speech acts. Yeah, we had looked at interrogative sentences, sentences spoken to require someone to provide information. We saw imperatives, which are spoken to get someone to do something. We saw declaratives, which are spoken to provide information. And we said declaratives are four types. We have factual statements, value judgments, definitions, and arguments. We saw the factual statements, we saw the definitions, factual statements, uh, statements um, about the external world, and the definitions that spoke to, uh, sentences spoken to convey information about meaning, value judgments are the claims about something's uh, value. We saw two types, moral and non-moral. We saw emotive expressions, we saw sentence fragments. And then from there, we went to the next class, which was um, definitions. For the definitions we saw, when we were doing the definitions, we, we started by distinguishing between the definiendum and definience. We said the definiendum is the subject, it's like the subject, the definience is like the predicate. The definiendum is what is to be defined and then the definience is what actually does the defining. Yeah. Then we, from there we saw the different types of definitions. We saw lexical definitions, the dictionary ones. We saw ostensive definitions, definitions you cannot pronounce or speak or write. Yeah. Then we saw the theoretical definitions, definitions originating from dif uh, different disciplines, academic disciplines. Then we saw the stipulative definitions, those, those kinds of definitions we can, any of us can formulate at any time for uh, a certain purpose. Yeah. Then we saw the operational definition, definitions that involve, you know, procedure, uh, pro definitions that involve some kind of procedure or operation. And then we saw the essential definition, you know, the essential ones, we said they are the only definitions we call the real definitions because they are the only definitions that are completely accurate you know every other definition is essentially contested and then we saw problems with definitions we, definitions can be too broad when the definience is referring to items that go beyond what is needed to define the definiendum and then if it is too narrow it is too narrow if definience is um, describing items that are not enough to define the definiendum. Then we saw definitions that are too vague. A definition is vague if there's no way of telling the class of things the definience refers to. And then we saw ambiguous definitions, definitions who, whose meanings can be more than one. We saw secularity, secular definitions are definitions that repeat the definiendum with the definience. Morality is to be morally right. We saw definitions that beg the question, definitions whose definience is uh, obscure or digresses from providing meaning or does not help in shedding meaning on the definiendum. And so that was for definitions. That was our second class. In our third class, we looked at discourses. Now coming to discourses, we saw that the discourse is basically a passage. Um, 
please, just two seconds so that I get something that uh, is close to me. Okay, so I'm back. So we saw, we're saying that there are basically two categories of discourses. We have the argumentative discourses and the non-argumentative. An argument is a passage, a discourse or passage containing a conclusion and premise or premises. We saw an example of an argument. We saw how to identify arguments. And then we looked at the non-arguments, which consist of the narratives, instructional passages, and the rhetorical polemic. Of course, there is no need to describe a narrative or instructional passage, but rhetorical polemic is what a few words, a passage containing uh, communicating strong feeling. We're saying that um, rhetorical polemic shares a certain similarity with arguments because both of them can contain claims. But we're saying that for argument, the claims are backed by premises or supporting reasons. Premises bearing supporting reasons or information. But for rhetorical polemic, claims are surrounded by emotive expressions. And then we went into verbal and real disputes. We said verbal disputes are disputes arising from misunderstanding or lack of clarity about meaning. And at once the meaning of something is sorted out, the dispute would uh, disappear. But we said the real disputes are not because of meaning. The real disputes arise about facts or people's preferences, people's values. So that was our third class about these courses. After that, we, the fourth class was on, um, the fourth class was on the, the normative and the empirical, the senses of law. So let me get the fourth class. Yeah, that's the fourth class, the normative and the empirical. So here we revisited our discussion of values and facts and we're saying that, you know, values are about what we should do or should not do. And then facts are about what is, what is or what is not. But we say sometimes we can mistake values for facts. There are some factual statements with implicit value judgments and we have given examples. We said the president has lifted a lockdown. That's a factual statement. The president has rightly lifted a lockdown that becomes a value judgment because you've inserted a word into that sentence. Then we saw metaphors and proverbs. We said a metaphor is a sentence that shouldn't be interpreted literally. You know. So most of the time it is not reasonable to interpret a metaphor literally. When you say it, it, it rained cats and dogs, you know. Cats and dogs don't fall from the sky. So there's no way you can interpret it between cats and dogs literally, and it will be reasonable. There is a non-literal meaning. That's the one we normally use to interpret it, which is that it rain heavily. But when you talk about proverb, a proverb has both a reasonable literally mean, uh, literal meaning and a non-literal one too, you know. Whether you go by the literal meaning of the proverb is still reasonable. The non-literal one is also reasonable and is very often a piece of advice. You know? So these are the two differences between a proverb and a metaphor. A proverb has a reasonable literal meaning, unlike metaphor. And then proverbs also provide non-literal meanings that uh, come in forms of advice. You know? 
Then we treated meaning defects in language. You know. We treated vagueness, we treated ambiguity, we saw their examples. We said vagueness is what? Vagueness is, uh, an expression is vague when its meaning has no boundaries of application, but an expression is ambiguous when it is capable of more than one meaning. And then you can take advantage of um, ambiguity by committing equivocation. So equivocation is to exploit the ambiguity of a word. Okay. So then we looked at the senses of law. We saw natural laws. We saw civil laws, cultural norms, customary law, moral, logical, mathematical, and divine laws. And that was the end of that class. And from there, we went into arguments. Uh, so in the fifth class, we got into deductive reasoning. In uh, deductive reasoning, we said it is reasoning in which the relationship between the premises and the conclusion is logical. And we saw an example, you know, we said it works somewhat like mathematics. We distinguish between reference and attribute classes, which reminds us of the distinction between definiendum and definients, you know. So you can see the reason why the, the, the two distinctions have different terminologies, you know. And then we saw finite and infinite reference classes. We saw universal and particular statements. We saw the issue of validity, what makes an argument valid. And then we compared deductive to inductive argument to see their difference. We saw what an inductive argument looks like. We said inductive argument is any argument that generates more than one possible conclusion. Then we saw the hidden conditional if and then and how it works, how you can translate uh, statements into conditionals. We were saying that, you know, um, when you see an argument you have to look for the premise that you can translate into a conditional statement. You know, we saw antecedents and consequence, and we're asking ourselves, how do you, how do you identify antecedents and consequence? We said, when you look at different premises, try to convert each premise into a conditional statement. Usually it is only one premise that you can convert into a conditional statement. You cannot convert any other premise apart from one premise into a conditional statement. Now that premise you are able to convert into conditional statement. That is the premise where you have the antecedent and the consequence. And then from there you can analyze the rest of the argument. You know. Okay, so, and from there we uh, saw the deductive rule or the rule for deductive reasoning. We said we can only affirm, we only affirm the antecedent and deny the consequent in order to reach a valid conclusion. Any other operation will make the argument lose its validity. So that is how we arrived at modus ponens and then the fallacy of denying the antecedent. Modus ponens, of course, is to affirm the antecedent. Denying the antecedent is a fallacy. Okay. Then we have modus tollens. We have modus tollens, which is to deny the consequence. Uh, if you affirm the consequence, it is fallacious. Yeah, somebody who is raising his hand, Philip. Hey, please, I don't understand them. Modus polens and modus tollens. Oh, that's unfortunate. So you have to go and read the video, watch the video, because we cannot under, um, explain modus ponens and tollens here, since that will take about an hour. All right, so <clears throat> then we have... Um, so that is how we came to arrive, we came to modus ponens, modus tollens, they are fallacies. And from there we went to, and we saw how they work with different methods. We used graphs, we used the diagrams, we used boxes, we used symbols, you know. After we did all that, then we went to 
hypothetical syllogism. We saw how a hypothetical syllogism works. The consequence of any premise in a hypothetical syllogism would be the antecedent of the next premise. And then what the conclusion does is to bring together the very first antecedent and, even, and then the very last consequence. <coughs> we saw two hypothetical fallacies and then we saw the disjunctive syllogism <coughs> After that, we saw the issue of validity versus soundness. <clears throat> and what does it take for an argument to be sound? <clears throat> Is it only validity? We saw an argument could be valid, but not sound. But for an argument to be sound, it has to be valid and also true. That was how we got to the end of this class. Then we went to inductive reasoning. <clears throat> inductive reasoning, we saw how it differs from deductive reasoning. We said for inductive reasoning, the relationship between the premises and the conclusion is not logical. You know, and then we, we said the premises provide reason to believe in the conclusion, but the premises do not guarantee the conclusion, you know, and we said deductive, sorry, inductive arguments are more or less probability arguments. They are extrapolations. We distinguish between verifiable and confirmable statements. And we said verifiable statements, you know, they usually make up the premises and the confirmable statements usually make up the conclusion. And we said the conclusion is not only called confirmable statement is also called um, hypothesis. You know, so uh, based on that, we saw that there are two kinds of conclusions to inductive arguments. We have the law-like hypothesis and, we, and then we have the statistical hypothesis. So basically we have two kinds of inductive arguments. We have those ending with law-like hypothesis and those ending with statistical hypothesis as, as conclusions. Yeah. Okay. We said the law-like hypothesis are, you know, they, they are more predictive compared to the statistical ones, but the statistical ones are somewhat, um, they, they promise more accuracy. We also said that inductive arguments are more or less extra extrapolations and we saw we discussed the various directions of extrapolation. We saw part whole generalizations, which consist of generalization and um, uh, statistical syllogisms. Then we saw analogies. We saw, then we saw predictions. And then we decided to go and look at the two kinds of inductive arguments based on the type of this is an example of an inductive argument that ends with uh, yeah now quality your mic is on but i've put it off so this is an example of an inductive argument that ends with a law-like hypothesis as conclusion we discussed its advantages and especially its disadvantages sorry Then we saw an example of an inductive argument that ends with statistical hypothesis as conclusion. And we're saying that this kind of argument is um, somewhat safer to make com compared to uh, the inductive arguments that end with law-like hypothesis as conclusion. You know, so those are the two kinds of inductive arguments. And then from there, we went to causal reasoning for causal reasoning, <clears throat> we started by looking at, uh, we said it is reasoning from cause to effect. And we said it's, it's a special kind of, um, it's a kind of inductive argument. You know? So you, you, it is not deductive, it is inductive because it is not, it doesn't have 100% accuracy. 
So that places it in the category of an inductive uh, or inductive reasoning. Reasoning from cause to effect. We saw the different senses of the word cause. We, we saw proximate cause, contributory cause, necessary cause, sufficient cause. We saw um, probabilistic cause. We saw causal agent. We ca saw causal chain and web. Then we saw the three, we discussed three patterns of informal causal reasoning. You know, we selected them out of the five that uh, John Stuart Mill had proposed in his book. And out of the three, we saw relevant difference reasoning, you know, trying to identify a difference in the environment in an attempt to explain a problem in the environment. Then we saw common thread reasoning, you know, where we try to identify what is common among all the cases of a particular problem, you know, so that we can see if we can explain that problem. Then we saw concomitant variation, which is a method of measuring the degree of something that cannot be eliminated from the environment, you know, to see if such a thing is happening at a degree that is not good, that is causing a problem. We saw the example with um, uh, identifying carbon dioxide or carbon or sulfur dioxide or selenium in the soil as causes of different health problems. From there, we looked at causal fallacies, that is instances of bad causal reasoning. We started with post hoc ego propter hoc, you know, where we said that just because something, just because A occurred before B doesn't mean that A caused B. Then we saw the non causal pro causa, the fallacy of exchanging cause for effect, you know. If A cost B, you and you and you said B cost A, then that's a non-causal pro-causal. Then we saw oversimplified cause, where there are many causes or more than one cause, and you don't identify all the causes of something. Then that's oversimplified cause. We saw false common thread, you know, a common thread that cannot be true. If you say all those that are bright in your class have cars, so getting a car will make you bright. We saw confusing correlation with causation and we're saying that correlation is not always causation. Before you conclude that a certain correlation is also causation, you need to do more research to confirm it. Then we saw slippery slope where you argue that you know if something happens, it will lead to something more serious, then something more serious again, something even more serious, and the order of seriousness will continue to increase without a serious justification. You know, so I think it with a slippery slope we ended that class, and then we moved over to uh, informal fallacies. For the informal fallacies. By the time we were looking at informal fallacies, we had already treated a good number of fallacies. We saw fallacies in our treatment of meaning, in our treatment of deductive reasoning, in our treatment of causal reasoning. So when we came here to informal fallacies, we, we looked again at some of those old some of those fallacies we've seen before, such as equivocation. You know, we saw equivocation in argument, how equivocation works in argument. We also saw how secularity works in argument. And then we went to grandstanding, appealing to majority. We said appealing to majority is a fallacy. And then we saw other fallacies ad hominem, where you praise or attack people instead of addressing their argument. We have both positive and the positive one is, is to praise the person. The negative one is to attack the person's personality. Then we saw appeal to authority, where you appeal to authority instead of providing facts or providing reasons, proper reasons for a conclusion. And then we saw genetic fallacy where you, where you say that something is good or bad depending on where it came from. And then we saw appeal to threat where you say that uh, if someone doesn't agree with you, something will happen to him. And appeal to pity where you whip up sentiment. And then we saw the we saw three fallacies of manipulating data. 
three statistical fallacies. We saw misplaced vividness, where you use a few cases to deny a general problem. We saw fallacy of semi-attached figures, where you, you try to defend a claim by using statistics that don't quite fit that claim. And then we saw history generalization where you try to you know, judge an entire population based on a few samples in the population. And I think that was the end of that class as well as the end of the semester. So right now I'm going to take questions from you. Anyone who has something to ask can raise his or her hand after which I'm going to end the class and then upload the video to your Sakai site for those who didn't attend to be able to watch. So if you have a question, raise your hand and then we address your question before we close. Expect your IA on Monday, and then after Monday, we'll um, consider opening up all the assessments so that all those who were not able to do them could um, do them. So anyone who had a problem doing her assignment can expect a retake. Steven Katanka. There. Yes, go ahead. Please, good afternoon. Yeah, good afternoon. Uh, sir, please, uh, I, I wanted to ask if you are done for the semester. Yes, exactly, we are done. This is our last meeting. Ah, okay, okay. Thank you, sir. You're welcome. Postina. Sir. Yes, go ahead. Please, you gave an example like uh, under post hoc, ego post proctor hoc. Yes. He said he won the election after visiting the chief priest. Okay. Like I won the uh, winning election after consulting a chief priest. Please, yes. So I want to ask if myth and mysteries like ma magic is not considered under this fallacy. Yeah, well, magic is um, that that example presupposes that magic doesn't work in real life. Yeah. So it is only if okay. um, we are saying that magic works in real life that we can say, okay, uh, he won the election after he consulted the chief priest. Okay, then that's a valid cause. The, the consultation with the chief priest uh, led to the victory, you know. Okay, sir. Yeah, so it, it, depends, it depends on what we accept and don't accept as uh, valid causes. Okay. Yes. Yeah, so, uh, patience. And also, yeah. Okay. Go ahead. You are. You are not done. Uh, yes. I want to ask if the three methods of mail are connected. Of course, the first two are connected. The first two can be used together. To open the, last, the last two is um, has is uh, really different from the, the first two. Okay, sir. Yeah. Thank you. Um, you're welcome. Then patience. Hello, sir. Yeah, go ahead. Please, you said um, we should be expecting our IA on Monday. 
Is it for the whole class or those that were not able to do? Hey, I will be that. <laughs> no, you have you have not yet done an IA, so that's it doesn't depend okay. on whether you did your your assignments or not. Ah, uh, okay. Yes. So, um, yeah. So the IA will be giving you thirty points. So it's not something you would like to joke with. And I advise you to do the IA between twelve and two a.m. Philip. Yes, uh, please. I want to ask, would the IO consist of all what you have done the whole thing? Yes, uh, especially what was not covered in your first two assignments. Okay, okay. Thank you, sir. You're welcome. All right, so I'm going to have to end the class and post the video so to your Sakai. Since this is our last meeting, I encourage you to keep working hard and um, remember to live your lives responsibly as citizens that should contribute to the development of the country and the continent. Be morally sensitive and make sure that um, you don't uh, follow those that um, are not um, following you. Please, I have a question. Yeah, go ahead. So please, what will be the mode of the final examination? Uh, that will be communicated to you. And I, I wouldn't be the one that is giving that to you. Okay. All right. Well, all right so um, yeah. let me see. Yeah, for Sina. Lisa, I want to ask if we can go to the assignment. Go through the like try answering it in class. Yes. Uh yeah, but it was given to you by this because we made some mistakes. Uh I'm not, sure, I'm not sure that will be available to you, but it is it, 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 it's the it's the the system that normally gives that to you. So the best thing oh, you okay. can do but if you have questions, can we send it through Sakai? Yeah, you can ask questions on on your Sakai chat room and then uh, uh, your tutor will um, address them. And then apart from that, okay, you, sir. you have to read your textbooks and do their exercises. That's the, I think that's the only thing that you, you have to do to uh, prepare for your assessments, all the assessments. Okay, thank you very much. You're welcome. So uh, Philip and uh, yeah, Philip, your hand was still raised. Um, Okay, so if there are no other questions, I'm going to end the class and I wish you all the best. So um, goodbye. Bye. Bye, Ife. Bye. Bye. Bye.